<laughs> I'm Alexis, known to my friends as Lex, and I'm a poet, nonfiction slash lyric essay writer, uh, editor. I do a lot of freelance editing um, and publisher of Penny Candy Books. Um, I'm a plant person, an animal person, an introvert, um, an all around lover of the beauty of art and poetry, I would say. I'm also like super, uh, super political and a bit of a misanthrope, but somehow that like <laughs> that hangs out in my living room <laughs> more than my public face. <laughs> yeah. I think one of my biggest influences, maybe two of them, uh, have to do with childhood reading and um, my grandmother. My dad's mom would take me to the library and we'd get a giant stack of books when I was maybe 10. And um, I would go live with her in the summers and in, in near Greenville, South Carolina. And um, well, live with her, I'd visit her. My mom would ship me off to, <laughs> to Grandma Betty's house, which was awesome. Um, so that was a huge influence, just learning to love to read. Um, got me wanting to, I think, be a writer. And the same with my mom. My mom would read to me kind of every night and I would ask her to read me really dark poems like Eleanor Wiley's, um, what is it, the sea creeps to pillage, she leaps on her prey, a child of the village was murdered today. Like I loved those very, very dark <laughs> kind of poems. Sea lullaby is the name of that. Um, so I think, and then I had a ninth grade teacher I don't know how she pulled this off, but we had an entire semester of poetry in the ninth grade. Um, and we had to write our own and we had these beautiful packets of poems the teacher had made with um, just all different kinds of poems in them. And I just really fell in love with poetry then. That was really formative for me. Here's my first ever poem. It's called Kiwi. Fuzzy football in the sand, shave the beard and bite the chin. <laughs> Um, so yeah I just fell in love with poetry I remember that that year also writing a poem about a dog who's got his tongue stuck to a frozen flagpole very you know strange and quirky kind of things um, I just always nursed that I went to I was on the literary magazine at, in high school and then I went to college and studied British and American literature took all the poetry classes that my school had, which were kind of few and far between. I went to New College of Florida. At the time, it was a 600 person honors college and we had one poetry professor. <laughs> but I did literally everything that he offered. I was his TA, he was my thesis, um, my thesis sponsor. I had some other great literature professors who supported the poetry as well. Um, and I wrote my thesis on Nikki Giovanni mostly her uh, gospel and jazz accompanied spoken word albums. And then I went to grad school for poetry and that was all she wrote. <laughs> I've been writing poems ever since. Uh, I'm thinking a lot about this right now because I'm looking for people to blurb my book that's coming out in, uh, in June. And so I'm thinking, about all my my former teachers and who has really influenced me. But I think uh, early on, my early poetic influences were people like Philip Levine, Yusef Komunyaka. Um, outside of poetry, I think Patti Smith uh, and her prose and her music, both <laughs> were big influences on me. Um, just looking at my bookshelf. Oh, this book was huge for me, uh, When Women Were Birds, Terry Tempest Williams. Um, at the time I read it, I think uh, my dad was dying and I really, it just really spoke to me. It's a quick aside. James Tate was a huge, you can imagine being a budding surrealist, James Tate was huge for me. 
uh, when I discovered you could write about the Pope as a poodle, I was pretty excited. <laughs> So I've been here for a little over a year, and we came here because my husband got a job here. Um, and I'm one of those people who has lived all over the country and has no problem just up and leaving. I have a very hard time putting down roots <laughs> in any uh, sustainable way. So uh, I thought, okay, we'll try Greensboro. I'd always wanted to live in North Carolina. I've lived in South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. Might as well just kind of get the whole southeast coast <laughs> um so far i love greensboro i mean it's been you know covid has made it tricky the last since march but still i think the hiking here just around the lakes is really wonderful and um before covid i basically lived at scuppernong books two to three days a week <laughs> they were my first friends in social life <laughs> when i got here um and so yeah, I I look forward to a time when we have events again and, and you know, I'm super uh, actually very um, introverted and don't actually love leaving the house all that much, but I do like to have a choice in the matter <laughs> at some point. Um, so yeah, I think it's so far uh, a good city. I like it. I hope to be here for a few years at the very least. I guess I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Penny Candy books because it is, uh, while I'm not writing any of the books, I'm publishing, editing, publishing, producing the books. And um, it's a huge, I think, creative commitment to acquire a title and take it from manuscript all the way to finished book. And it definitely checks a lot of the boxes of like creative fulfillment for me in terms of seeing something come to life. I feel, and I feel proud of those books in a way that like, my, well, I, I, in a different way than I do my own work because um, I almost feel like a parent <laughs> and I feel proud of the authors and illustrators and, and the way things come together with those titles. Um, so we have two books coming out right now in this, the fall and then two more in the spring for Penny Candy. I have about three manuscripts of poetry. I'm kind of always juggling, working on simultaneously. Um, the one, the book about my dad is coming out with Corey Press in June, and it's actually not poetry. It's a memoir in fragments, I like to call it. I mean, some people have read it and said, oh, this reads like prose poetry. I don't think of it as poetry. As a matter of fact, I have a version of the book that is poetry. <laughs> that maybe someday when I'm rich and famous, I'll, I'll say, oh, let's look at this other version. <laughs> let's publish this one. <laughs> um, and so it didn't, and they feel like while the structure is the same, they feel like very much different art forms. Um, I'm working on some eco poems right now, seeing how's how the world is burning. Um, they're, <laughs> they're actually post-apocalyptic eco poems. And so it's basically after the world has burned, and humans are just kind of dying out. I've like, I have this basic, this world in my, in my head that I'm writing from. There's a poem where like humans grow antlers out of, but they're made of wood, kind of out of their, very strange poems. There was actually two op-eds in the New York Times about five, six years ago by Walter Dean Myers and Christopher Myers, both children's book writers of acclaim. Uh, and the thesis, you know, it, each article was about the lack of diversity in children's literature. Um, Christopher actually called it the apartheid of children's literature. And um, I think Chad and I, my business partner, we were just like, we were really, influenced by that and this was before we had any idea we were going to start a children's book company um but in that way we you know we said oh we could be you know we could be the change in a lot of ways and so that's what we did you know we started 
just getting word out there, asking people if they had manuscripts, welcoming manuscripts from beginning writers and started to build a catalog that way. We're really interested in publishing books that push for children, you know, that push those boundaries and, and, and create big conversations around social justice and um, diversity for kids. Um, I wake up, my husband brings me coffee in bed every morning. How lucky is that? Um, and he gets up early to go to work. And so then I read and write for about an hour just in bed. Um, I'm reading Philip Pullman's second book in the Book of Dust series right now, which I love. Um, but usually it has to do with poetry and, and getting ready for the day, writing, journaling, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then I get to work on Penny Candy or, um, lately I've been having a hard time prioritizing my own writing because Penny Candy feels like we have like a bunch of fires to put out. <laughs> but generally I'll like split the day between personal creative projects and um, Penny Candy projects. Pre-COVID I would go work at a coffee shop two or three times a week just to kind of get out of the house. Um, and I go for a walk in the woods three or four times a week um, just to clear my head. Um, right now, I'm, I actually started volunteering at the um, urban farm at Prince of Peace Lutheran and that's been great fun. And I'm, I've just started uh, an internship there where I'm gonna be curating a bed and creating creating what I think is going to be a medicinal plant area. We'll see. I'm also interning, so I'm learning a lot from the farm manager there. Um, I feel really lucky that they've kept that open for volunteers. We just wear masks and keep distance. Um, so that's been nice. Uh, I've the, I think the, the longer I'm at this, the more I realize I need something else that's very hands-on and earthy to complement being in your head all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, so my days are kind of boring. That's kind of what they look like. Sometimes there's a little like spontaneous dancing. Um, eventually I'll find a new yoga studio or a pool to swim at once COVID is over. Um, yeah, so it's mostly in front of a computer slash reading a book, writing. I am, I'll just be honest, I, uh, for a few years now, have really been struggling with self-confidence as an artist. I had a couple things happen like in the poetry world uh, that caused both of my books to go out of print. Um, kind of real, you know, like traumatic community experiences. And I just, something just made me want to go hide and I never did build that confidence back up. You know, and it's funny because, you know, I was like a finalist in the National Poetry Series last year, but I still don't feel, I don't feel the confidence of that. <laughs> What I feel is, oh, but I can't get another book published to save my life. <laughs> um, so that's, and maybe that's something all artists struggle with, is you go through these periods of like, what am I doing? Why? Why? Um, like I said, I think right now in this period of history, I struggle with, uh, am I just joyfully, blindly making art? should my art have some kind of agenda um you know you see a lot of these the are i read a lot of the eastern european poets who were exiled or writing political manifestos in the early 1900s and i think you know is that what or south american writers were doing the same and is that what our poetry needs to be doing if we can do that um so that's a struggle just kind of theoretically, philosophically, um, and just enjoying it, period, right now. <laughs> just enjoying making art. You, I think you have to sit down at 
the computer are, are in front of paper every day to make the inspiration come maybe one out of, you know, 50 of those days. <laughs> but there's that real tension between that and then feeling like I in some way have to be political with my art because I feel so strongly about what's happening in the world. But I don't also don't feel like necessarily that kind of writer. Like I don't, when I'm trying to be political, I just think my work sounds bad <laughs> in a very, um, you know, on a scale, like this is not good writing. <laughs> I might be saying something worth saying, but uh, so that's a tension I feel right now. Like what's the use in me kind of exploring my subconscious noodling around all the things that I take pleasure in, in writing poetry, uh, when the world is burning and we can do something about it and, or we want to be able to do something about it. Sometimes I think the machine is so big that it's hard. I don't know the purpose of making art other than a very selfish, like, I gotta do it sort of thing, you know? I don't, I almost don't think about what the purpose is because I've never felt like I had another choice. Lately I've thought, what if I had be gone, like, there was a time when I had this choice between going into like botany and plant science versus writing. And I can look back and see that and think, huh, that was actually a choice. But at the time, there didn't seem to be a choice. It just was, you have to do this thing, this, and I didn't realize I could actually make art and do, <laughs> and do plant science at the same time. And, oh, that could be a really cool <laughs> marriage. Um, so the purpose of making art, I, get, I think it's just a human, some humans need to make things. And, you know, some, some do that via painting on a canvas some I just love noodling around with language you know I've you know I do things I make books like I make handmade books I, and I like to do things with my hands too but number one it's you know I gotta I gotta make those words work for me <laughs> um, and the role I think an artist has in society is it's more just it's more than entertainment I think that art ignites imagination and like we talked about earlier empathy and uh and also just joy in a way that humans need um i don't think it's necessarily for me at least it's not a um an escapism art is never about escapism it's about experiencing things more fully and from someone else's perspective i think that's maybe the most important thing about art is seeing the world through someone else's eyes, someone who has worked really hard to, uh, to make you see that in, in their, from their vision. Workshops and things lined up in North Carolina, South Carolina, you know, places that right when the pandemic hit, we weren't thinking about, you know, changing them to zoom workshops like we hadn't gotten quite that far yet that happened quickly but <laughs> so I lost a, a little bit of you know um, monetary kind of compensation in that way but also just getting out there and, and reading and doing workshops changed so that's and that's you know I'm attending all of these zoom readings and like tomorrow I'm doing a zoom or Wednesday I'm doing a zoom workshop for uh, Scuppernong, Penny Candy is doing like a five, a series of five workshops with mostly our authors, but I'm like kicking it off. So that's changed because all of this, now we have these cool Zoom workshops where we can reach people all over the country. So there are upsides. I have my attention span for, for like a Zoom poetry reading is very, very short. I just get like screen fatigue pretty quickly. Um, so just the kind of the way we do our ancillary stuff has changed. I don't think the actual work itself has changed, you know, it still happens either in your notebook or on your computer screen. Um, 
I feel like, and I haven't mentioned this, but I feel like there's a st- space, there's more space to think and breathe. And maybe that's just a, you know, I don't, I don't feel compelled to be out of the house as much or, you know, when the pandemic first hit, everything got real quiet and no one was leaving. P- planes weren't going over. The world just felt a lot more quiet and peaceful. And that was like almost a welcome breath of fresh air for a minute. It hasn't lasted, but. <laughs> and in terms of um, penny candy, the pandemic has affected us drastically. We're down like 50% sales from this time last year. Um, every, I think the publishing industry is still a little bit in, in just a little disarray. I know that bookstores, they were down like 60%, but then they've popped back up, a lot of them. Um, But nobody really is, like, you're not having in-person sales meetings, so bookstores aren't buying uh, upcoming books in the same way that they would. Things are just, you know, all the distribution is different. Everybody's a little confused about where to go from here. So we're hoping that things will kind of, pop back, but we don't know at the moment. Gertrude Stein illustrated by Bianca Stone. And I'll just pull open one of the pictures because I just think, oh my God, what an amazing uh, illustrator. I don't know if you know Bianca Stone's poetry comics, but uh, she does poetry comics, basically. Um, and this, so this Gertrude Stein poem is, you know, not intelligible to a child audience or to most grown-ups. That was, I think, Stein's point. But what Bianca did that was so genius was she created a story that feels like it somehow relates to the words, but it's its own narrative on its own. And um it's wonderful, but it's not like it's going to be a New York Times best-selling book. And I think as poets, we, you know, we've always held the work itself to be the most important thing. And that's great. And also maybe not the greatest in a free market economy that relies on, you know, sales and capitalism. 